I'm Kalyan Viramachanini. Yes, it's hard for me too. <laughs> I lived with that name all my life. But today, I'm a data scientist at Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT. So imagine as you wake up and go to your coffee machine, and it tells you how many days you have left before you run out of your favorite coffee beans. If you get in a car, the car predicts where you're headed towards even before you enter your destination in your GPS. If you go, if you go and take an online class, the online learning platform suggests that you take a course in physiology because it thinks that that may be of interest to you. As you go out for a run, the wearable device that you're wearing tells you whether or not you should worry about an impending heart condition that you're worried about. These are just few examples of data-driven systems that are around us and what they can do for us. Some of them already exist and you may be using them. Some of them are under development as we speak. Some of them, me and my team at MIT are developing. So I am a data scientist. I developed a number of such systems in past few years. I build predictive models, and I derive them from data. These predictive models, for example, I build the predictive model that predicts the destination before you get, as soon as you get into the car based on your driving history. In another context, I've built predictive models that could predict an adverse event for a patient in ICU. While, I'm, while I built these predictive models, I realized that the technologies I was employing were not new. What was new was the rate at which I was being asked to build these predictive models. The, the increased demand at which we, we are being now asked to build predictive models comes from the increased availability of the data. To respond to this demand, we wondered, how could we develop these solutions faster? How can we get to these predictive models from data faster? So me and my team at MIT thought, how about we build a robot? that does what we do when we look at a new data set and a new problem. We challenged ourselves, could we build something that could replace us? More concretely, we challenged how can we automate the most challenging aspects of the data science endeavor so that it, is a, allow, it, it allows to en enable and enhance human creativity. As crazy as that, so as, as that sounded at that time, it was embraced by my team and particularly one player in my team. Max Cantor. He and I together embarked on this journey of how to create a robot that will replace us, that will do data science instead of us. To do this, we reflected as to what steps do we take when we encounter a new data set and a new problem. So let's take a real example. In 2012, MIT started to offer its courses online for free. The first course, Circuits and Electronics, had over 150,000 registrants from all over the world. Out of those 150,000, 7,000 students got the certificate. So in a typical online course, and the students interact with online learning platform by watching the lecture videos, submitting solutions to their assignments, talking with each other on online forums, sometimes grading each other, and sometimes even creating new material to understand the concepts better. As they go about doing this, we, we record every click they make on the website as a data point. We call this student interaction data. So given this data, we were asked, could we build a predictive model that could predict whether a student will drop out of the course and leave the online platform? To do this, we were given tables of data. The first table recorded every interaction every student made on the platform. The second recorded the student attributes, such as their demographics or their education level. The third table recorded the attributes of the modules that they were interacting with. When we are given these tables, the first thing we do is we try to come up with explanations of student behavior and quantify their interactions with the online platform using something we call variables or features. An example of a feature is the time the student spent on the course watching lecture videos. So we think about all these features that can quantify the student's actions on the platform, and then we go back and write software to extract these features from the data. As a result, we get what we call a student feature matrix, which students as columns and features as rows. Features are what we call variables. Once we have that, we take those, 
that data, that features data, and, uh, and build a mathematical model that can predict the outcome, in this case, the dropout. Computers can already build these models on their own. But what data scientists have to do is to specify the model type, the structure of the model, and the parameters that make up the model. And we, as data scientists, myself and Max, we were iterating over those values to, to improve the model and its performance. As we reflected about, upon this process, we realized that we were going back and forth between these two steps, every time going back and thinking about new features and variables to quantify the students. So for example, another feature or variable that we came up with was how long before the deadline does the student start working on the assignment. It turns out to be the most important predictor of dropout, as you can imagine. Once we have these newer variables, we would go back and refine our models again. So in a sense, if you wanted to automate the data science endeavor, these are the two steps that we needed to automate and we needed to have a robot do. So as a result, we decided that we will build two automation tools. The first one called deep feature synthesis. What this algorithm does is when a data set is given to it, it identifies what are the entities in the data set. In our data set, it was students and modules. Second, it identifies the relationships between those entities in the data set. Finally, it applies statistical functions to data at the intersection of those relationships. As a result, it creates hundreds or thousands of features that characterize the student's behavior on that platform. Just as a comparison, we were able to only create 28 variables over a period of six months. Now this machine can create hundreds of variables simultaneously. The second thing we did once we had the variables, we had to replace the second part of the endeavor where we were hand tuning the model and its parameters. To do that, we, we realized how we were doing it. The way we were doing it, we would set a parameters value at four, and we would see the model performance. We'll increase the value to six and see if it got better. If it got better, we'll increase it to 10 and keep going on till we hit a point where we can't increase the model's performance anymore by changing that parameters value or in, instead of increasing, we started decreasing, at which point we would stop. We simply built an algorithm to replicate that process, perhaps with a little bit more intelligence because we can store more data about the tries and trial and error. So once we had these two components, we had what we call a data science robot that can go from raw tables and go all the way and build predictive models. To test our data science robot, we decided we had to pit it against human data scientists in data science competitions publicly held data science competition. The first competition, as it turned out, was about dropout prediction. In this, in this competition, we were supposed to predict whether a student will drop out within the next 10 days or not. 277 data science teams participated in this competition, and the competition went on for three to four months. The data science robot beat almost 85% of the competitors in this competition and also achieved higher than 90% of the top score achieved by any competitor in this competition. With this result in hand, we got a little bit more ambitious. We decided we'll go and compete in other competitions as well. So the next two competitions we competed were also publicly held. The first competition was about whether or not a particular project will get crowdfunded. The second competition was about whether a customer will come back as a repeat buyer based on his interactions with the online store during a promotional period. In both these competitions, the data science robot was able to get nine, almost 90% of the top score achieved by any of the competitor. As a result, what we observed that together across all these competitions, there was like 1,000 data scientists that participated. And the, in, together, all of them put together a 1,200-day worth of effort to solve these problems. The data science robot was able to do this in three days' worth of computational effort and was able to achieve 92% on an average of the top score of any competitor in these competitions. The last 8%, as you can imagine, is hard for any machine to overcome. So with this, we decided what else can we do with this data science robot? What is, that we, what is its use? Then we went back and reflected on our original motivation. As I mentioned, the increase for data-driven solution, increase in demand for data-driven solution is phenomenal nowadays. And I also mentioned that the technologies that we use to build these data-driven systems is certainly not new. 
it's only the rate at which we are being asked to do them has challenged even the most experienced data scientists like myself. So how have we responded as a society? We have started to train more and more people as data scientists by starting numerous degree programs. We have also started to encourage a thriving startup community around data science. So if you think back, usually such, a, such an increase in demand is triggered by some new infrastructural development. This situation is certainly not new to us. Way back in the and 60s and 70s, researchers were connecting computers so that they can communicate with each other. But the technology we have today, its need did not arise till the demand for any time, anywhere packet delivery skyrocketed in late 90s. So what was the trigger? The trigger there was massive development of infrastructure, networking infrastructure. To respond to that demand, computer scientists started to use algorithmic approaches to build networking algorithms so that we can deliver packets any time to any place and places where we couldn't imagine at speeds where we couldn't even imagine in 60s and 70s. A similar trigger has, has caused this demand and increased data-driven solution. And that is the infrastructure of cloud. So while cloud-based systems have allowed us to store data easily, big data processing systems have allowed us to process and retrieve data really fast, what is still a fundamental bottleneck is the human involvement in analyzing and interpreting this data. So perhaps the data scientists can replace the humans in certain activities, but our ultimate goal is to bring humans back into the loop, but this time at an unprecedented scale. What do we mean by that? You, as you're living your life, as you're living your daily life, you're generating data. From the time you wake up and smell your coffee to the time you go to bed, there are now systems in place that can record data about your experiences, your choices, uh, ranging from the coffee flavor you like to your sleep patterns. Wouldn't you like to know more about yourself from your data? So how about we make all of you a data scientist? How about we make everyone we know as a data scientist? How about we democratize data science? The implications of that are huge. What that would mean is that you would be able to download your own data and ask questions of it and build predictive models. So in this example, you would be able to download your own data about your bank transactions for past three years, which as of today you could do with some banks. And you can then query this data science robot and decide what predictive model to build and build a predictive model that could predict how much you will spend perhaps on cab rides or how much you will save by the end of this year. So in a sense, we went back and thought that this is what the purpose of data science robot is. It is to enable us and aid us and improve our creativity. In other words, as data scientists ourselves, we actually didn't want to lose our own jobs. <laughs> but in the end, it has a good purpose. It is, to, it is there to make our interactions with data easier. And it is to make everybody be able to ask questions of their data and generate answers for themselves. Thank you.